Good morning, everyone. My name is Linda Quiroz, and I am the Outreach Manager here at Montgomery County Women's Center. Uh, I have been here with Montgomery County Women's Center for about six years. Um, I started off as a victim advocate, so I was on call 24-7, responding to uh, survivors of sexual assault or domestic violence. Every Monday, we are um, hopping on here and talking a little bit about um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, uh, different topics. Last week, we did a Myths versus Facts introduction video. And this week, we are doing uh, ways to stop contributing to rape culture. Um, so we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, to First, to start off, uh, we are going to talk about what Montgomery County Women's Center um, does and who we are. So the Montgomery County Women's Center has been around for over 40 years. Uh, we offer a variety of services and all our services are completely free. Um, the first thing that I like to talk about is our emergency shelter. Our emergency shelter operates 24 seven and we house up to uh, 75 residents at a time. Uh, we also offer a 24 seven hotline. That is also um, the hotline that you can use to access our services for shelter. But on top of that, our hotline is a very neat resource and I like to call it our gateway into our services, just to know more about what we can offer and how we can help. We also have an advocacy team and this advocacy team is composed of uh, at least, I, will, I believe it's seven advocates and they respond to the hospital. We also have a legal team and we offer uh, legal services and these are free of charge as well. Some of the legal services include um, family law matters, so uh, custodial, uh, divorces, um, even protective orders. We also offer a counseling and support groups. Our counseling and support groups are offered um, in our Woodlands location and um, those counseling and support groups are also free. We uh, also offer transitional housing, and then lastly, but not least, our education and community outreach, which is what we do here at Montgomery County Women's Center. We go out into the community, into the schools, provide these, these videos for you guys, um, and just try to educate the community on both domestic violence, sexual assault. Um, we also go as young as fifth, sixth grade, and we do education and community outreach for them on topics such as bullying, healthy relationships, et cetera. Um, and below you will find our 24-7 hotline, which is 936-441-7273. Now to jump right into what rape culture is, let's first discuss what it is. So rape culture is a term used to describe a culture in which rape and other forms of sexual violence are common, and in which prevalent attitudes, norms, practices in media condone, normalize, excuse, or encourage sexual violence. So all in all, rape culture just, it's, it's a long term to when we describe how sexual violence can take place, but also some examples that can include rape culture, you know, it's, you know, myths about sexual violence, the victim blaming, uh, even language that trivializes rape, jokes, uh, sexual object, objectification in ads. I know we see that a lot in TV. Um, images that glamorize sexual violence. Um, even song lyrics. I know that some songs that I used to listen to back in the day, and now when I listen to them now, I'm like, oh my gosh, what are these songs insinuating, or what are they? Um, what are they trying? What message are they trying to send? Um, but we don't think about it at the time because it's just something that we enjoy, right? But all of that contributes to that rape culture, and that. All of that sends confusing and harmful messages about what consent is and much more. I like this little uh, picture right here on the side, just because it kind of, um, in a nutshell, describes what rape culture can look like. We live in a society that teaches don't get rape instead, instead of don't rape. And I can't agree with this more because... Um, Day in and day out, I see, you know, different ways to protect yourself or I see, you know, cover your drink or I saw this really neat thing where um, what this was a couple of years ago where somebody had invented a nail polish where if you dip it in the alcohol, um, it would change color if there was it was it had been tainted or somebody had done something to it. And so, yes, these are all great ideas, you know, the, the self-defense classes, the the taking care of your drink or don't take don't accept drinks from strangers but the reality is is that when we place the blame on the victim or we place that responsibility on the victim it allows for people who perpetrate to get away with it and so instead we should be teaching don't rape you know people who are 
going out and having fun or who are even just hanging out with friends shouldn't have to say, okay, what do I need to do to take care of myself? Rather, people should think about the way that they are and then change the way that they are and teach as young as we can. And so then we're going to cover some of the ways that we can contribute to ending this rape culture. So the first and foremost is creating a culture of consent. This is a big one. You know, if we understand from the beginning what consent is and how important it is, this will help create better and healthy interactions with one another. Um, I think this will also empower us to speak up and say when something is not right or we feel uncomfortable. And then as simple as it says, you know, create a culture of consent. So don't make consent be this um taboo word or a lot of times don't talk people don't talk about consent because they think it relates directly to sex but not necessarily um you know consent comes in all different ways and is just as simple as giving that yes not just for sex um but however this does not mean it's on someone to say no i know that um for a while i've had heard people say you know no means no um and it was kind of like um like a slogan for consent or for sexual sort of awareness month. And, you know, and I agree, but I think, you know, that we should move from no means no to yes means yes, because we're talking about consent. And when we say no means no, I think in a sense, we're kind of um, waiting. It's like putting that responsibility back on the victim and we're waiting for them to say no. Right. And so instead, when we shift from, no means no to yes means yes, you're looking for that yes. You're looking for that enthu enthusiastic yes. And so, um, and then with consent, you have to start as young as possible. I know sometimes people think, oh, well, consent only comes with sex. But I mean, as young as that child starts talking, it gives them the opportunity to know that one, they have boundaries, they have the right to say no. And if they say no, then that boundary should be respected. And that is teaching them consent at a very young age. And that's so important because when they learn that they are able to say no, or when they learn that they say no and somebody doesn't respect that, then, ah, you know, red flag. Why, what's going on? Why is this person crossing my boundaries? And so this has to be taught as young as possible because then you grow up into creating these healthy relationships. Then we jump in into an easy way of how to talk about consent. And you look at this picture right here where it says prize. So it could be freely given, um, which means that both partners have the freedom to say yes or no. Consent doesn't involve any type of pressure, force, of, or manipulation. It is reversible. Anybody can change their mind at any single time, um, even if you are in the middle of, of the affection. It is informed. Both partners need to know exactly what they are consenting to every single time. It's enthusiastic. This is what we look for. Both partners should be excited and very much interested in what is happening. If they are not, stop immediately. Um, and it should be specific. Each individual affection requires consent each time, even if you have done something before. And this is very, very, very important. Um, when we talk about consent, know that it is one, not a binding contract. Two, it is something that you can change your mind on. And, and you don't necessarily have to give yes. I mean, um, sometimes people think, oh, well, they didn't say no, or they stayed silent, or they didn't fight back, or they didn't, um, they just said, I don't know, or you know what, they said yes last time, you have to look for that consent right there and then. And if not, check in, you know, it's important to check in with whoever it is, it doesn't matter. So creating a culture of consent. The next one, which I think is a very, very important one, and one that, I mean, I think I see all the time everywhere, uh, social media is a big one, is stop victim blaming. Uh, it does not help in any way. Um, you know, if I'm being blamed for a crime that I did not commit, if you put yourself in the shoes of someone that had been sexually assaulted, sexually harassed, whatever it is, why would you think that anyone would want to talk about it or come forward and report when they're these are kind of the kind of questions that are being asked. So like, for example, you know, why didn't they fight back? They shouldn't have gone home with them. What did they expect going out dressed like that? Why did they get so drunk? You know, all of that perpetuates that rape culture. But on top of that, it continues that victim blaming. And sometimes maybe that might not be your goal. Maybe you genuinely want to know, you know, why didn't you report, right? Why did you wait so many years to report? But the reality is, is that when you are a victim of sexual assault, your first thought is not, oh, I need to go report. Oh, I need to go to the hospital. I need to do this. I mean, your first thought probably is, okay, what happened to me? 
why did this happen to me? Um, maybe feelings of doubt, maybe you're scared. Maybe, I mean, this is a traumatic event that's just happened. So it cannot be something that we expect. We There is no such thing as a perfect victim, right? There, There is going to be reasons why people don't report. There's gonna be barriers to reporting. There's so many, but on top of that, people will still have these questions of, you know, well, what were you wearing? Why were you going out? Why, you know, this is why I always say we have to take care of our drinks. And that does not help in any way. It just leads more to it. And instead of uplifting and helping these survivors, we are contributing to this rape culture and not helping them at all. Um, and then again, you know, many times you can't even win, you know, you can be the perfect victim where, you know, you were assaulted and you, let's say you immediately reported, you immediately sick help, you immediately went to the hospital, someone would still find something wrong, you know, someone would still say, uh, well, did it really happen? Um, and especially if it's someone that's known to the community or known within uh, maybe that friend group, that family, there will still be some questions. Instead, what we should be doing is believing survivors, we need to support them and uplifting them, because this is how we continue to help them. And I think this is another reason why um, sexual assault is the most underreported. I think 80% of sexual assaults go underreported. And I mean, I don't blame them, you know, with all of the way that um, society with the way we, we talk about survivors, I mean, just in general, on social media, for quick example is, um, Maybe there'll be a release on the news of someone who was a victim of a sexual assault. And let's say that this person was well known to the community or maybe an athlete. And I mean, as soon, correct me if I'm wrong, but as soon as you click on those comments, the first thing that you will see is, well, why did they wait so late? It's all these questions, all these questions of, of blaming this victim. You know, why did they wait so long? They want something out of it. They want um, attention. I mean, nowhere do, I mean, maybe one that's filtered out will say, you know, poor them, I believe them. I hope they get the help that they need. And that's what we should be doing rather than having all these questions of why they didn't report, why they came out so late. And this also contributes to that rape culture. Um, <clears throat> the next one is being an upstander. So to be an upstander, it means we're intervening in situations where we're making a positive impact. And this is where I think power and privilege can come into play. Um, I know a lot of times people, you know, see something and sometimes don't want to say something because they feel like, you know, it's not their place or it shouldn't be them. But what we have to realize is that sometimes that could be, you could probably have been that one person who could have done something about it. And the reason I say that is because um, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, it's not my business. I'm not going to get in the middle of something if something is going on. But if your one action could have changed that whole situation, you know, be that upstander, you know, being that one person who just speaks up. And, it, and I'm not saying go and, you know, let's say someone is trying to sexually assault someone and and you go in there and you beat up this perpetrator like that this is not what i'm saying at all what i'm saying is that if you recognize that the situation is not right you know your gut is telling you something is wrong you know you use like little different things so some tips could be use a distraction to redirect the attention even if you go talk to the person who could be in trouble that's a way of helping so even saying hey are you okay or if you see that person uncomfortable even pretending to be their friend and saying, hey, um, I haven't seen you in a long time. How you been? Like, let's let's chat. Just something to distract that situation because just that little one action could have completely changed that whole outcome. Um, even grabbing a group of friends and saying, hey, I don't feel right about what's going on over there. Let's go talk to them, right? Doing something. And if you don't feel comfortable, but you know in your gut something is wrong, call the cop, you know, call the police, call the authorities, especially if you're concerned for someone's safety um, and you don't want to intervene, especially if you're by yourself. But there's so many ways of being an upstander. And it's important that we start talking about that, right? Um, and start even just checking in with our own actions, not just ignoring, but even taking that responsibility. Um, and then even also knowing your resources. So if let's say someone comes to you and they need something or you see something, um, knowing what resources are around your community or around your area. Um, and I like this little thing over here in the picture where it says it only takes one, one person, one action. It can deter a perpetrator who believes no one will intervene. And this is very, very important when it comes to um, being an upstander. Okay.
There we go. And then um, that is it with us. And oh, went to the next one. Okay. Um, so that's it for uh, these ways to stop contributing to rape culture. But um, if you guys have any questions, you know, put them down in the comments. If you guys want to add more, there's so many other, I mean, I, there's a whole list of ways that we can stop contributing to rape culture, but these are the main ones that I like to talk about and cover just because uh, these always come up in conversation. But, you know, every Monday we will have a different topic. Um, Sexual Sword Awareness Month, we will have, we have a variety of events. So going to our website at mcwctx.org, you can look at all the, all the, um, uh, opportunities we have for you to join into our events, even uh, our webinars and all that fun stuff. So thank you guys for taking the time to watch this and we will see you next Monday.